Great. Um, so firstly, thank you for allowing me to give a, a seminar here, presentation. I've not been here very long as a PhD student, so I moved from Seabees. Um, but it's, I really like it here. It's a nice place to um, come and work. So I'm going to give you today um, perhaps a small extract from my PhD. I'm going to talk about planning. Um, and specifically, my PhD is all about why people waste food, basically. And I have my own kind of take using uh, theories of practice that I'll explain. But I want to focus on planning because I feel like it's a practice that's kind of misunderstood. There's a lot around um, at the moment in terms of food waste campaigns around preventing food waste, making sure you plan, etc. But I found from my research that that doesn't always really reflect what happens in the reality of the ev every day. And I've actually got cases where people have kind of tried to plan um, what they do and to not waste food, but actually end up wasting more food than they would if they hadn't planned. So I'll, I'll go through that as well today. So I'd hope as a food-based centre you all know that food waste is a really big issue. To give you a kind of a few statistics, it's estimated that 1.3 billion tonnes of food is wasted globally, that 45% of fruit and vegetables that are grown for human consumption don't actually end up being eaten by humans, that, that could be wasted or used for other purposes. Um, in the EU, we waste something like 80 million tonnes of food each year. Uh, just over half of this comes from households, from consumers, and the UK is the biggest contributor towards that statistic. Um, we were the most wasteful country in Europe, um, which is surprising considering there's more people that live in Germany than the UK, but somehow we waste more food than they do. It's estimated that um, the average UK family throw away £470 per year of food that they buy and never eat, which is really shocking. Um, and finally, it's a really big contributor towards climate change. It's estimated that uh, 3.6 gigatons of carbon uh, footprint comes from activities relating to food waste. So it's a really critical issue to tackle. Now, my research looks at um, the kind of to very top of the food waste hierarchy, looking at how we can prevent food waste. Um, there's lots of activity kind of down here that maybe engineers or more kind of um, physical scientists might look at, um, but I'm looking at this kind of top part of the food waste hierarchy. Um, I'm not quite sure if I'm kind of a sociologist or a geographer or a consumer behaviorist, but um, really looking at um, to prevent food from becoming waste. That's the priority. That's the most kind of um, efficient um, way of solving the problem as, as I see it. Um, and this really concerns the kind of social context of waste and also consumption. So how does food become waste? There's lots of kind of conduits through which um, we buy food and we source it and it transfers through from shopping to going to the supermarket all around our everyday practices and how we use it in the home and how that then ends up being wasted. And there's lots of kind of intricacies to that that I've looked at in my PhD. And this might involve things like to challenge the topic, reevaluating, disrupting, and relearning consumption practices. So it's not all about disposal, it's about the stuff that happens before that. And finally, um, questioning to what extent are current food waste um, prevention campaigns really working? There's lots of information out there at the moment, but we are still continu continuing to throw away food. Um, and that was one of the kind of the underpinning problems that I'm looking at in my PhD. So you might have heard, seen this sticker on some of the food from the supermarket. This is the kind of main campaign run by Rapper in the UK. They give it lots of advice about what to do. You might recognise Jamie and Jimmy's programme that's been on TV. Keith Fernley Whittenstall as well has talked about um, food waste as well. Quite a kind of prominent celebrity figures. And also every supermarket in the UK has their own campaign as well. So Waste Less, Save More is the, the Sainsbury's one. And they might include things like this, so meal plans perhaps, um, planning how to shop in a better way, etc. Um, and they underpin pinned by being more organised, basically. Being more organised, planning what you're going to do in advance. Uh, and this idea is around being more accountable, so households kind of knowing what they're going to do in advance, um, and the idea is that they will then less waste less food. There's also key links to kind of saving money and saving time. So money seems to be quite a kind of solid approach that's used in some of these campaigns around um, getting people to be involved in them, especially when you consider the £500 um, is wasted by the average household every year. But on the kind of flip side of that, it's shown that few consumers actually do plan their shopping. Shopping can be something that's quite um, prompted or it's not always planned. Um, it can be difficult to plan. It can be tiresome and inflexible. Um, and also the literature points at the idea that some people are really good planners and some people just improvise all the time. And I kind of challenge that a bit in my research as well. I think there, there are people that are really good planners, but they have moments where they really can't be bothered at all. Um, and finally, 
research has really addressed planning as part of a series of behaviours. It's not really being something that's just on planning and that's it. It might be part of a study on shopping, perhaps, or what people do in the home, um, and not really kind of researched it um, as a whole context of it. So the main aim of my PhD was to understand how consumer food waste behaviours are placed within the context of everyday lives, not just looking at why people, um, not just looking at what they think about food, but why they're wasting food and how that relates to what they're doing every day. Um, I specifically looked at routines and habits, different lifestyles and patterns of living, food planning, consumption and disposal, and also coordination with work and leisure. And I'm going to focus on the bit of food planning. This has kind of turned into seven different sections of findings that over three different chapters, and food planning is one of those seven. So thinking about um, how we go about researching why people might waste food, a lot of the literature first talks about, okay, we need to understand what people think. What do they know about the food waste problem? So we might turn to look at attitudes. So this might involve um, aspects of cognition, our values, our morals, our motivations, and our intentions. But it's also been shown that there's a bit of a gap between what we actually think and what we actually do in terms of our behaviour. So our actual behaviour relates to our performed actions and what we do in practice. And we can say that there is an attitude behaviour gap. There's a gap between what we know about an environmental issue and what we actually do in practice. And I've shown in my, uh, in my master's research before, where I looked at food waste in universities, the students kind of, they didn't really think they wasted much food. But looking at the statistics of the university that I researched, loads of food was going to waste. So they didn't kind of weigh up the fact that so many people said they weren't wasting food, but actually they were. So we can say that um, food waste is one of those kind of um, perhaps unconscious behaviours to a certain extent. So applying this attitude behaviour um, diagram to the issues of food waste, our attitudes might be rated around knowledge of the food waste problem, um, environmental ethics, and also concerns around uh, saving money that I addressed earlier. However, actual behaviour might be influenced by the mundane nature of everyday life. So if you think about how many meals you make in an average week, are you really thinking about food waste every time you make a meal? Probably, probably not. Um, we're also limited by our routines and habits, so um, we might have a really good plan of how we're going to eat this week, but because we're so busy, that doesn't come into, um, that doesn't happen. And also the kind of visceral reality of food. Food waste is something that's really icky. I'm sure um, each of us have had something in the fridge at some point that gets really horrible, that you had the best intention of eating, but then you just, you just don't want to do that. So, um, so I'm trying to make the point here that there's a different way of seeing um, or researching why people might waste food. So the theoretical underpinning of my PhD is theories of practice. So rather than look at um, what people know, I'm looking at what they're actually doing, their actual practices. Um, and this kind of questions this kind of cognitive accountability of individuals. So you want to understand what they're doing, their actions rather than just what they think. Um, so now practices become as the central unit of analysis um, rather than just um, kind of opinions and, and attitudes. And we can say that practices are made up of different elements and resources. So one of the most quoted um, or used models of theories of practice is by Elizabeth Shove, and she says that a practice is made up of materials, meanings and competences. So for example, if we took a pr the practice of presenting, you might say the materials are the infrastructure, the, the clicker, the, the computer, the screen, etc. The meanings are related to well, what does it mean to give a presentation, um, what we understand as, as doing, and the competence, competences would be how do you know how to do that? You know, there are examples of, of people presenting, and we, if you said to someone, I'm going to present, you'd know what you mean by doing that. And you can say that those three together are a practice of presenting. Um, I'm also, they do take into account both agency and structure. So I said before that I was kind of denouncing the cognitive aspects of behaviour, but they do take into account agency in terms of what do we understand in, in terms of what is presenting. So there's like meanings there. So a definition might be um, practice is a routine type of behaviour, a collection of actions that constitute bodily and mental activity that better reflect both uh, conscious and unconscious behaviours. So there are numerous interpretations of a theory. Of a theory of, it's not one theory, it's several theories that are used across different fields. I've used a lot of work from um, Alan Ward's approach, which is to do with sociology of consumption. But in this presentation, I'm going to specifically draw on 
Theodore Shatsky's work. Now, he uses this term called teleaffective structures. That sounds really complicated. But basically, all it means more is that everyone has an idea of the end purpose of a practice. So the end purpose of presenting might be to kind of relay information in such a way that the audience understand what, what you're on about. Well, I'd, I'd hope that, and hope so anyway. Um, so the practitioner has an idea of the purpose or end goal of every practice they engage in. And I've used this topic to look at planning. So what is the end purpose of planning? How do people understand planning? And how is planning resolved? So some of the questions might be, what factors con condition how planning is resolved? How, how does it happen and how does it not happen? And what are the implications for food waste prevention in looking at how, practice, how um, planning is resolved? Okay. So in terms of methods in my PhD, I wanted to look at what people actually did rather than just what they thought. So I had 23 households in my PhD, and I asked them all to take pictures of the food that they ate, prepared, and threw away for a week. Um, and this was a really good account of what they actually were doing for that, for that actual week in their, in their lives. They also took pictures of things like receipts, um, their food waste bin, I asked them to take pictures of their fridges. People's fridges are really interesting to look at. Um, and, and then we would afterwards kind of come together and have a conversation where they would just go through the pictures and tell me what they've been up to that week. There wasn't an emphasis to say, did you waste any food? They would just tell me what they've been up to, what meals they ate, what ended up in the bin, what was eaten, et cetera. You know, going through the sheets saying, okay, what happened to this yogurt? Did you eat that, et cetera. Um, and they were more like kind of chats rather than an interrogation of why did you waste food. They also did a number of reflective maps. So they drew a map, for example, of that local area and where they worked and, and where they shopped, how these might have linked together. And they also did some kind of routine mapping. So I had like a, a Monday to Friday schedule and they would write down what they normally do in each day. They did like a, a top-down view of the house as well and where things are placed and where they might cook and where they might eat, etc. And it was always contributing towards this idea of um, you know, what, what are your everyday practices and then drawing out food waste from that. So to start off in terms of the findings, um, what did the practice of planning look like in the study? Well, normally we'd associate planning with kind of a written menu, a meal plan, a physical food plan of this is what I'm going to eat on this day, etc. that might somehow relate to a shopping list as well. And participants were, um, they acknowledged this and they knew, they knew what that was, but really the most common type of planning was a mental plan. Uh, this was like a mental activity of drawing upon food resources at hand and past consumption experiences. There were examples where they would do both of these as well, um, but generally this was the more common plan. But when asked about how they planned food, they wouldn't talk about this kind of mental behaviour that was kind of throughout their lives. It was always, okay, no, I don't have a meal plan for this week. So that was interesting. I'm going to give you three examples now of participants um, and how some of their meal plans turned out. So the first one was Michelle, and she lived with her husband and wife and young daughter. And she talks about how she was really busy and how she didn't have time to always eat together. So she says here, it surprised me a little bit how much we didn't throw away. And this is interesting because she actually did throw away lots of food. Um, <laughs> but I must admit, um, also what brought her home to, to us was that we don't actually as a family have very much time to sit down together. So last week we only had two days, Tuesday and Friday, where they actually sat down together and had food. And this had implications for well, how does that relate to a food plan? They had a family food plan to eat meals together, but there was only two nights in that week where they actually, that actually happened. So she goes on and says, I finished here at quarter, quarter to five, so she's talking about work there. Um, I have to be back home with my daughter who swims at six, so I go home, put some stuff on the plate, and then I go back out to the swimming baths. We typically buy what we need for the week, planning and stuff. We do that every week because we found we are just spending too much money that doesn't mean to say that sometimes it, gets, it get, doesn't get thrown away because by the time we get home, we don't want what's on the menu. So they make an active effort to plan, but because they're so busy or because of their own preferences, some of the food that they've thought to plan then goes to waste. So here are the, oh, what unfolded was not in line with the purpose, the purpose of planning. So here are the two pictures of, that she took of the food she threw away in the study week. Um, and this was kind of general stuff that was bought with the best intention of eat, uh, eating but went to waste. So there was kind of some spinach, etc., some salad, um, it's kind of tins of tomatoes. These were all sandwich fillers, I think, there that just went uneaten, um, coleslaw, etc. It should be noted as well that Michelle was a participant that had kind of like a high visceral um, 
sense, I guess, if that makes sense. You would throw things away even if they were only just out of date, except you didn't want to be involved in that. And I've discussed that in a, a separate chapter of my PhD. Um, but what's shocking here is perhaps how much food is being thrown away that hasn't been used. And there were other bits and bobs as well that were, that were thrown away there. So this was her local area travel map. Um, it's quite unclear because she did this in pencil, but what you can see is all these different journeys that have been happening from the home. So you've kind of got work, different supermarkets. Um, this is here relates to the swimming pool. Uh, her daughter was quite a big swimmer and she would kind of do things around taking her to and from swimming, etc. So it might be like top up shopping, etc. But it kind of shows that um, she had lots of different places that she went to during the week, all by car as well. Um, quite a kind of chaotic life in, in some <coughs> regards. Maybe not quite that chaotic, but you know, in terms of family, family practices. So to give a, another example of more informal planning, I turn to Julia and Carl, who were a couple in the 30s. They both work full time, but they both had the ability to work at home. They say that they don't tend to plan. They usually plan while they shop at the weekend. Um, they get two or three things and they cook um, for the week. Um, and they're not really sort of planning out exactly what they want. Now, they were interesting because they didn't really waste much food at all, but they didn't really have a plan at the same time. Um, and they say here that more thought goes into it at the beginning of the week than at the end of the week in terms of their planning. So they were quite organised, but they didn't really have any kind of proper food plan. And they say here, for example, that sometimes they can't be bothered to plan at all, and they end up eating quick stuff like salad or pizza is something that doesn't have take that long to cook. So looking at some of their meals, um, they reuse a lot of stuff as well. They kind of cook the chicken and use it in wraps several times. You've got a soup that appears a few times as well. Um, and they say, for example, a lot of the soups in the house are made from range of vegetables uh, from whatever's in the fridge. So this was interesting because they didn't really plan that much, but they didn't really waste much food. But perhaps one of the key aspects was the ability to work at home. They had lots of time to kind of be near the food and know what was in the fridge, etc. Whereas other participants that were out all the time couldn't really tell me what was in their fridge um, at certain points. So to give one last example, we turn to Antonia and Christian. Again, a couple in their 30s who both work full time. And they say that they just go with whatever they fancy each week. While they shop, um, Antonio here talks about how he had some kind of ideas for recipes, um, but he forgot to kind of plan them out properly. Um, and he ended up just forgetting that they were there and eventually they kind of go to waste. So there's this kind of linking of kind of shopping there that they like. They like shopping a lot and kind of thinking of things as they went around the supermarket. So they're a good example of how performances evolve and take place in different forms up until ingre how ingredients come together. So whether this might be days before the meal um, is cooked or even minutes before, there's always a process of how um, things that are planned might kind of somehow slip or be evolved in a different way. So thinking about how planning um, <coughs> changes and how there's variation in planning, I thought about some sort of scale to do with time. So at one end, you've got kind of far away from the meal time. And at the other end, you've got a point at which food comes together. And I try to argue that there are different forms of planning practice across this scale. So at the one end, you've got the like, idea of a formal meal plan that happens quite far from where the actual meal time happens. Um, and it takes time to kind of um, put it together. And if we do, you might have more like mental exercises of planning ahead, prompted by um, around the shopping, and perhaps share consumption with other household members as well. And then at the point at which food comes together, it's just a mental accounting of, OK, what can you make from what's at home? And looking at how this might intersect with other practices, far away from the meal time, there's a real good acknowledgement of the demands of the week, where people have got to go, etc. Um, in the middle, you've got some kind of household coordination of collaborative consumption of who's going to be where at what time and who can make what, what meals. And finally, planning evolved through preparation to suit the time constraints. So you've got an hour, so you've got to go out again. This is what you can make, etc. So I'm going to skip the next one. So in terms of kind of putting uh, conclusions on this, I think we can kind of question whether planning is a stable practice of how it's being promoted in food waste campaigns to prevent food waste. Also, I think there's a mismatch between the promotion of planning as kind of like a culturally shared practice and the reality of the variance in which it's being actually performed. Also, households um, that had like a, a menu plan or adopted a menu plan can actually waste more food. 
um, because of the realities of everyday life, and I had three examples of that in my study. Um, and also, it's unrealistic to expect consumers to sufficiently employ materials provided. So just because supermarkets or uh, RAP or the Love Food Waste Hate Campaign provide these materials, that doesn't mean all consumers are going to adopt them in the same way. And for certain households, there's going to be kind of more ma some materials that are more applicable than others. So I think we need to really con reconsider um, putting both formal and informal kind of information into these um, campaigns. Um, thinking how planning is interspersed with different moments of consumption across wider work and leisure. So that might be allowing for some disruption or some disruption tool to help consumers work out um, what they're going to eat and when, etc. And also perhaps redesigning some of the materials to facilitate, I just said this, in, in, in interruption um, and help them resolve planning in such a way that they don't end up wasting more food, etc. So, um, and that's it. Thank you.